I am in a place called as Attur Karkala, which is in the state of Karnataka. And today I'll be showing you a place that is religiously very important for the Catholics around here. But before I show you the rest of the place, let us just dive into the history of Mangalorean Catholics. There is a saying, we cannot know who we are unless we know who we were. And unless we know who we were, we will never know who we are. We Mangalorean Catholics, uh, most of us, the majority of us, the, the overwhelming majority of us have a Goan origin. Therefore, we need to start in Goa. Now, the new Christians migrated in three major phases. And the first phase began during the Goan Inquisition. Now, when the conversions began, many of the new Christians kept following their old traditions and these were termed as crypto christians you may be wondering why would christians themselves leave goa during the goan inquisition i mean wasn't it supposed to be biased towards christians itself but the answer to that is very complicated we won't really deep dive into the goan inquisition because it's a very complicated and a long topic and it's not something that can be covered in just a small video many of the christians although they converted they kept hold of their old traditions this is something that the portuguese government did not like more laws and enactments were brought in to completely eradicate the old customs. The concrete language was banned and there was rigorous imprisonment and punishments to anyone who was still following the old customs. So in order to preserve their language, customs, traditions, many immigrated from Goa. Christians emigrated from Goa for different reasons. It's around the 1570s when Bijapur had attacked, uh, there was about a 10, 10 year um, confrontation with Bijapur and especially in the southern part in Kunkuli and uh, Asolna, those parts of Salset, from about the mid-17th century uh, till about the mid-18th uh, century, that is almost about 100 years, there were major migrations because of the Maratha invasions. Goa had to pay a very heavy price to recover their territories. And that price eventually came on, on the Christians to pay up because, uh, and the churches, of course, converted their silver and sold that and other things, plus a lot of... Uh, uh, Brahmins also had uh, made contributions to pay the Marathas off. Now, uh, that set off a lot of uh, uh, migrations again to Mangalore. Because of the economic problems that uh, happened in uh, Goa during this time, uh, and this forced people out. In fact, you know, in Bardes, from which a large percentage of our Mangalore Catholics uh, uh, come from, Bardes, uh, a government report mentions and says very clearly that Bardes could not grow enough food to feed its population for more than four months in a year. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, for people who are, don't have food and don't have uh, security because of invasions, they have to come down south uh, where the food is in abundance. Now the Christians who escaped Goa were mostly farmers who had abandoned all the irrigated fields in Goa to achieve freedom. Now at the time of the migration, Canara was ruled by the Keladi king Shivapa Nayaka. These kings took great interest in the development of agriculture in their empire and welcomed these farmers, giving them lands to cultivate. And that brings us back to the town of Karkala, one of the many places in Canara where the Christians settled and thrived. This shrine of St. Lawrence traces its origins all the way back to 1759. The population of Mangalorean Catholics grew fast and spread across all the coastal areas. They became rich with trade, agriculture and eventually even owned vast lands. However, what seemed to be a golden era for them would soon turn out to be a hell, as the worst was yet to come. Uh, Christians, you know, Konkani speaking Catholic Christians of Karnataka, Konkani is our mother, mother tongue. We have a history of about 500 years in this coastal Karnataka. Before that, we were not in this, uh, in this area. We migrated from Goa. So, in this entire 500 years, if you see, we don't find a bigger enemy than Tipu Sultan. Our biggest enemy in these 500 is this only man called Tipu Sultan. He destroyed us completely. He completely disintegrated our community. He killed 75% of our population. 75% he butchered. 25% remained because he died on an untimely death. That's why 25% of our generation remained. Otherwise, we would have been, you know, you know, just one word in history. Such a, such a, you know, community existed once upon a time. Now, Tipu Sultan came into power in the year 1782, following the death of his father, Hyder Ali. 
He is one of the most debated figures in Indian political history, a tiger for some and a tyrant for others. There are a number of uh, different theories on this, but my own view is that it was uh, it was nothing to do with any religious aspect of uh, uh, bigotry or anything from Tipu, but it was a very clear political consideration uh, in in his effort to legitimize his rule and to show that uh, he was uh, his authority came from. And uh, his attitude, he equated Europeans who were his main enemy as Nasrani, and these Nasranis he equated as Christians, uh, Kiristan. And uh, he took all the people captive. He took them to Srinagarpatna, but he also took an equal number, practically, from Mysore and from Tamil Nadu, because these were the local Christians. They're not from Goa, Goan origin, but local Christians who had been uh, uh, converted over time by the Jesuits and others. This is actually what you see in front of me. Uh, this is the new church. There's an older church that is right behind this. I'll take you there as well. Before the older church, there was another, the original church, which was a few kilometers from here. There's also a cave here, which is right behind around that mountain. Those are also called the Parpale Caves. So before the Catholics around here, or Christians around here were taken, they were kept in captive in those caves for many days. The picturesque little town of Karkala has a long history dating back to over two centuries. The shrine of St. Lawrence at the quaint village of Attur in Karkala has been thronged by devotees since 1759 and is closely associated with this town historically, socially and spiritually. The reconstruction of the present shrine of St. Lawrence at Attur has an interesting background. The parishioners of the old church at Nakre ventured out to find a new site for the church. Along with them, they carried a one-foot-tall statue of St. Lawrence. At the foot of the Parpala Hills, the parishioners stopped to quench their thirst at the spring welling up at the foot of the hill and placed the statue down for a while. Once they were ready to go again, they realized that they just couldn't lift the statue off the ground. The statue remained glued to the spot no matter what. The priest realized that St. Lawrence had chosen that spot for his new shrine. As soon as they decided to build the shrine at the venue, the statue moved with ease. Thus, the present-day church was built at the very same spot in 1839. 1784, uh, February 23 exactly, and it was a Wednesday. That day, his soldiers attacked our community <clears throat> and that was a Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is the first day of our Lent season, 40 days of fasting uh, yes. and after and it ends with the Good Friday, the death of Jesus. So it starts with Ash Wednesday. On Ash Wednesday he attacked on our community and uh, that was the day of fasting and prayer and it's compulsory to visit the church. church. There he caught hold of the people right from Sunkeri of Karwar up to Mangalore. There were about 27 churches, big churches. Out of them, he attacked all. All means all did not spare a single one. 25 he managed to raise to the ground. And two he could not raise to the ground because local Hindus protected. One is in Mayun place. Mayun only the, um, the roofing was damaged. Local Hindus, three uh, village, uh, Aikala, Thalipadi and uh, Elinje. These three village uh, heads came to our rescue, they gathered people, they stopped the soldiers from destruction of the church and thus uh, our church was saved and we are honoring those Hindus even today during the annual festival, every year we do that and one church near Modubidri that was saved by Jains, they saved the church and rest all 25 churches were raised to the ground and one famous church of Milagres church in Mangalore, he destroyed and with those churches he built a mosque and that mosque is existing right today called Bauta Wulde, right in front of Eloshius College, there is a mosque yes. which is which has been built with the stones of uh, Milagres church and there is Sultan Bhattiri, the fort called Sultan Bhattiri was built with the stones of Rosario church, Rosario Cathedral is the biggest church in Mangalore even today. Okay. That church was destroyed and with those stones, uh, Sultan Bhattiri was built. That was the destruction he caused our churches and he killed our people, captured them live and he by walk he took them to Srirangapatna right from Sinkiri of Karwar up to Mangalore by two routes. One is via Srengeri, one is via Beltangri. Soon after signing the Treaty of Mangalore in 1784, 
Tipu gained control of Canara. He issued orders to seize the Christians in Canara and confiscate all their estates and belongings. All this in a well-planned move on Ash Wednesday on the 24th of Feb 1784. Our history goes back centuries. We start from the Saraswati era in which our ancient ancestors migrated from the Saraswati River Valley. One branch came to Goa, another went to Bengal, and that's how the languages are connected. And then in Goa in the 16th century, they were, they were converted by Portuguese missionaries. The next step was the migration to Canara to different parts. They came by boat. And finally, in the 18th century, when they had made Canara their home, when our customs started to, de to develop, we had the shock of the invasion of Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan. They were absolute foreigners, more, even more foreign than the Europeans. So whatever the Manglo natives felt about uh, who they prefer, whether they preferred to be under the Portuguese or the British or Tipu, it was their choice. We shouldn't take the stand that just because Tipu was Indian and we were Indian, it was our duty to support Tipu against the others. That's, there's no truth whatsoever in that, in that logic. There was no India. Our country was just Canada. And so whatever the Manglorian Catholics decided that they preferred, it was their choice. Tipu didn't give them that choice. As soon as he was victorious in battle, he took the whole lot by force and imprisoned them in Sri Rangapatna. And only after they were released in 1799, our history began. What started in 1784 finally ended in 1799 after 15 years following the death of Tipu Sultan. After the death of Tipu Sultan and the end of their captivity, many of these Catholics came back to these lands. Now when they returned, they found that all their lands, all their properties, all their belongings, everything was taken away from them. They came back having absolutely nothing. So many of them started working in you know, f rice paddies and fields of nearby. All their properties and everything were confiscated or taken over by people of other religions. The Christians of Karkala were just one of the many who were taken captive and the first shrine of St. Lawrence was just one of the many churches that were destroyed during Tipu's reign of terror. Almost all of today's generation of Mangalorean Catholics are descendants of the ones who survived the 15 years of captivity. Our ancestors endured enormous pain, sacrifice and even death to preserve our language, traditions and religion. 500 years of trials, tribulations, survival and finally our modern day success. <laughs>